Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the uh, Polo Hospital's Facebook Live session. Today's session is with Dr. Thirmalai Ganesan, uh, consultant urologist, Polo Heart Center, Chennai. Uh, as you know, we'll be talking about the topic, all you need to know about men's health today. When it comes to prevention and early detection, men's health often takes a backseat as they're more likely to be put off by routine health checks and also differ appointments with a healthcare provider for symptoms of a health problem they may face. But the good news is that many of the health conditions and diseases that men face can be prevented or treated if found early. In order to take better care of their health, it's imperative for men to understand the risk factors and how they can improve their overall health. To address the need and importance of men's health, we have with us today Dr. Thirmalai Ganesan, consultant urologist at Apollo Heart Center Chennai. So without further delay, we'll move on to the questions which uh, you had asked us. So the first question, doctor, is about uh, prostate gland enlargement. The uh, viewer would like to ask this question. My prostate is enlarged and I'm taking Dutas tablet, but I feel pain on the right upper abdomen. See, the issue now is that you're taking uh, Dutas for your prostate problem. But there are certain things which I would like to know. Is it um, because I know that you know it is not like a, a direct one? We normally just give this dutas to reduce the size of the prostate. There are two types of medications given for prostate: one to relax the prostate so that your flow will become better, and dutas is the one the tablet designed to shrink the prostate or reduce the size of the prostate but it will reduce only by 20%. The pain associated with the uh, prostate symptom could be related to prostatitis. That means some amount of infection may still be there. But so what I would suggest at this particular stage would be to go back to the doctor and uh, tell him that you've got some kind of a discomfort or pain. You need to be examined because the pain, the upper abdomen or the lower abdomen could be related to other conditions as well. It need not necessarily be related to prostate alone. So what I would suggest is that whether you've got any prostatitis or not, that means infection or inflammation of the prostate, is it there or not? If you go and check with the uh, urologist, that will be helpful because dutas alone may or may not relieve the pain. You need to know the cause for the pain. Doctor, this is a very common uh, problem in men, especially about 50 years. So is there anything as a precaution that uh, people can do, men can take, or is there any uh, symptoms that uh, we need to look for? Right. Prostate is present only in men, not in women. And basically, the enlargement starts by about 30 or 35. People start noticing prostate problems only after 40 or 50, but more so after 60 years of age. What are the symptoms? which you need to look for. Most of the times what happens is that the wife will notice you going to the toilet many times at night. That's called nocturia. That is getting up at night to pass urine. And second issue is that sometimes during the daytime as well, you feel that you need to go to the toilet to pass urine many a times. And you start feeling flow, slow flow. If you go to the airport or if you go to any other public toilet, you'll be passing urine some other person will come and pass urine before you and you'll go off and you'll be spending more time in the toilet to pass urine. So these are the early warning symptoms or signs of the prostate enlargement. The question now which is asked was, can you prevent prostate enlargement? Unfortunately, you can't because it's age related. It's like cataract because whether you like it or not, there are certain changes which will happen in your body, like wear and tear mechanism in the bone, like back pain, the knee pain, likewise, eye changes like cataract, it's like heart changes, it's like age related changes. So, age related changes will happen in the prostate whether you like it or not. But unfortunately, there's no other preventive method like exercise, diet, or medication to prevent the enlargement of the size of the prostate. But there are certain medications available to shrink the size of the prostate, but they'll have side effects for we do not encourage the patient to take as a preventive measure. Thank you, doctor. Uh, the next topic uh, the patient would like to ask is about kidney stones. 
like uh, how do kidney stones actually form and uh, what are the treatments available for them? It's a million dollar question. Basically, if I know the answer, I'll get the Nobel Prize. The reason being, no one knows exactly how the stones are formed. It's like, you know, how each one, because the people ask questions, why me? Why it happens to me? Because my father is okay, my mother is okay, my sister is okay, but why me? There are a lot of factors for uh, formation of stones. You know, why stones form? The basic concept is that if you take a glass full of water and put some salt, dissolve it, dissolves. Put more salt, it dissolves. To a certain point, it comes to what we call as a saturation and supersaturation point beyond which it will not form, it will not dissolve. It will form crystals. So which patients are prone? There are certain things what we call as a genetic factors. That means you're prone to get, that's why we have a family history of stone disease. There are certain what we call as the environmental factors where in which patients will get the stone disease as well. The reason being one, lack of water intake, because if you don't take enough water, because suppose if you're sitting in an AC room, what will happen, the lack, the need for thirst will come down. So basically you tend to take less water. So if the less water is available for dissolution of the solutes, people tend to form crystals. So that one, you know, people tend to form stones one. And next is the environmental factor. Suppose if you're working in a humid or a hot condition, like, you know, Middle East or Northern part of India, what will happen? The water evaporates through perspiration, sweating, and then less amount of water will be available in the urine to just take away all the particles like solutes, like calcium, uric acid, those kind of things. So they'll form stones. The other factors, dietary factors. They're supposing if you're taking too much of non-vegetarian items, the end product of the non-vegetarian item will be uric acid. They'll form stones. People may think that I'm taking too much of milk. You know, calcium is there. Not necessarily. You need to take milk at least two glasses a day. So if you don't take, I think you will form stones. So calcium should be moderated. There is another thing called oxalate. Oxalate is present in palak or, you know, there are certain uh, uh, vegetables when which we advise the patient to take less of oxalate. And there are uric acids, like, you know, even if you take tea, too much of tea, nuts, peanuts, cashew nuts, they will have all kinds of uric acid and oxalate. So we tend to tell the patient, modify a diet. So genetic, non-genetic, these are the causes. Thank you, doctor. And uh, what sort of treatment options are available for people with kidney stones? Depends on the place where the stones are there. Supposing if it is within the kidney, small stones, four mm, five millimeter within the kidney, we tell the patient to drink plenty of water, try to avoid certain food items. But supposing if the stone is coming into the kidney and then becoming bigger, like one centimeter, 1.5 centimeter, the first option which will be available would be to give some shockwave from outside to blast the stone so that the powder will start coming through the urine. The other option which will be available would be to make a small puncture into the kidney and then try to take the stone out. Or you can just pass a small tube through the urethra, urine tube, go into the kidney, use a laser and try to powder the stone and then take the stones out. But supposing if you get stuck in the tube connecting the kidney and the bladder, if it is going to be a four or five millimeter stone, there's a 90% chance that will come with medicine itself. But suppose if the stone size becomes seven or eight millimeter, the chance of it coming on its own is going to be less. So in which case, what we normally do is that we pass a tube from down below, try to just break it with a laser and then try to take the stones out. But the stone is in the bladder. If it is going to be big, we have to pass a tube from down below blast it again with a laser and then take it out. So these are the ways by means of which we do that. Thank you, Doctor. Uh, the next question is about liver problems. So what are the common liver problems which men face? And uh, since there are a lot of people who have a habit of uh, taking alcohol, so what in, in, you know, how does alcohol affect the normal functioning of a liver? Good question, but I'm not the authority. I'm not the uh, uh, person to just answer this question. I'm a, a pure urologist. So it's very difficult for me to uh, answer this question. But by and large, if you just take as a general, definitely alcohol damages the liver. Because there is a thing called alcoholic hepatitis and there is a thing called non-alcoholic hepatitis. Non-alcoholic hepatitis is completely a different ball game where in which you tend to develop liver problems because of sugar. Sugar causes some kind of a cholesterol issues. That's called fatty liver. And suppose if you just go for a scan and a master checkup, what happens is that the sonologist will give a fatty liver. So that's totally different. Now. But suppose if you just take the uh, alcohol, see, there are 
three or four types of drinking. You know, one is going to be what we call as a uh, experimental drinking, you know, when you just become uh, like a, a teenager. It's recreational drinking, social drinking. Suppose if you just go for a party, you just take drinks. That's absolutely acceptable. Another one is that, you know, you just addicted to alcohol, then alcoholism. There are four things. Daily taking, without that, you crave for it. Even up to the case that it's binging, alcohol binging. What it does is that it goes and completely damages the liver. It, it destroys the liver cells, and then the liver cells, once it is destroyed, what happens? It starts regenerating. That is damage, regeneration. Damage, regeneration. It's a cycle. When it starts doing that, the, the liver, instead of a smooth surface liver, it become, become like a nodular liver. And when it becomes like a nodule, it causes some kind of a scarring. And when scar happens, it completely blocks the bile, completely blocks the blood vessels and things like that. So nothing will pass through the liver. Liver is supposed to be the factory. That is a metabolic function. The whole, the body's function is completely uh, uh, managed only by the liver. So it's a metabolic house. Suppose if you damage the liver, that's it. You know, basically, you know, once you lose the liver, you have to just go for liver transplant, which is an expensive thing and the results are not that good. Thank you, Doctor. Uh, the next question is about uh, urinary continence. Uh, there are uh, quite a few viewers who had asked about uh, frequent urination and having to get up at night multiple times to pass urine and also about uh, urinary continence. So can you share us, uh, share something about that topic? Doctor? Sure. See, urinary um, incontinence or uh, um, leakage of urine has got multiple causes. So we just take a simple thing like nocturia. That's getting up at night to pass urine. Normally, you know, when before age of 50, when you just drink plenty of water, doesn't matter. The kidney, the, there is a hormone called ADH, antidiuretic hormone, which is the gatekeeper for the kidney. What it does is that it completely shuts the kidney down at night so that even if you take water, it shuts off the kidney so that you don't have to get up at night. But once you cross 50, the hormone level comes down. So what happens? The kidney will think that they, we need to just produce more urine like daytime so that we always advise the patient to change the lifestyle. Suppose if you're going to bed by 11 o'clock, your last drink should be around 9 o'clock. Two hours and that should always be there. So that everything gets washed out before you just go to bed. So first thing is going to be lack of hormone is one. Second cause would be prostate problem can cause waking up at night as well. There are other causes of getting up at night. People always think that only prostate problem, bladder problem can cause this kind of a night of waking up. It is not so. If you've got a heart problem, cardiac problem, what happens is that the fluid will be accumulating in your leg or feet, whatever it is. So night when you lie down, all the fluid will just come back to the heart and then gets pumped into the um, um, kidney and it starts coming out at night. So if you've got getting up at night, you've got a problem, you need to check your heart as well. You need to ask the, uh, uh, you know, if you ask the uh, uh, urologist, the urologist will be checking your kidney as well, will be checking your liver problem as well, because all these things can cause retention of water in the body which gets extruded out at night when you just lie down. So that needs to be taken care of. And there is a condition called obstructive apnea. That is people will snore. And then you know when you just, you can't just get sleep. So what, when they get up, what they'll feel is that, okay, fine, let me just go to the toilet and use the washroom and then they just come back. So OSA, what obstructive sleep apnea, that is a sleep problem also is one of the reasons for getting up at night. The other problem of uh, urinary frequency, urgency, especially in women, the problem is what we call as overactive bladder. See, normally what happens is that when the bladder fills up to a level of 400 or 500 ml, then you know that you know you need to go to the toilet to pass urine. But unfortunately, what happens, there are some individuals who will have a bladder, what we call as a overactive. So normal active, underactive, and overactive. So overactive bladder, what happens is that even if you hold 100 or 150 ml, the bladder cannot hold it. It tends to just push it out. So it's called overactive bladder. So people suffer from this and then they'll have this kind of a frequency, urgency, leakage of urine. They can't just hold it. So these are the, this is the overview of the incontinence and getting up at night to pass urine many a times. Okay. I've also heard there are some exercises which, uh, which are there to actually reduce the uh, continence. Sure. 
I think the one thing what I forgot about the uh, incontinence is the, uh, the, the one overactive bladder is causes urgent incontinence. That means when you have the sensation to pass urine, you need to rush, you need to rush. If you don't go there, it will just leak urine. The one thing uh, about this particular question is called stress incontinence. That means when you laugh, when you cough, when you just do any activity, physical activity, you will start leaking urine. This happens especially in women after they just bear two or three children. What happens? The pelvic floor becomes lax, weak. When it start becoming weak, I think you should not hold the bladder down. So basically, I think uh, you know, sorry, the uh, control mechanism tight. So when you cough, or laugh, it opens up and urine comes out. So the one thing what uh, the uh, viewer asked about the uh, question about the exercises, it's called pelvic floor exercises, or uh, it goes by the eponym Kegel's exercises. So when you do this kind of a pelvic floor exercises, it tends to strengthen the pelvic floor or the control mechanism so that, you know, when you cough or laugh, I think, uh, uh, you know, it will be uh, absolutely fine. There won't be any leakage. But, you know, the exercises, you need to be practicing ceremoniously. It is not like, you know, you just do for some time, you feel better. Three months down the line, I'm going to stop it. You know, it's a lifetime commitment. Supposing if you feel that the exercises are not working, then you need to go to the next option of what we call as the surgical option. Fine, doctor. Uh, there's one more uh, question related to urine, doctor. Like the viewer says, my urine is not clear. And there's another viewer who says his urine is yellow in color, but all his liver functions uh, are normal. His uh, bilirubin is normal and all other related tests are normal. So what could be the reason, doctor? And uh, as a lay person, uh, should we pay very much like close attention to the color of the urine or is, is there something which we need to be aware of regarding the color of the urine or is it um, like how, how does it work or does there's a color affect you know the health of the uh, health of us or uh, do we need to be concerned about that so the one question is color another one is, is about uh, urine not being very clear okay that's all i mean it Foggy, means the same right. yeah okay see as a urologist, you know, when, when you normally ask for any test, we always just ask for urinalysis. The question, this is the uh, commonly asked question is that my urine is high colored or yellowish. The reason why you get the color of the urine is that there is a pigment. See why, why the, the leaves are uh, um, uh, green? Chlorophyll. There is a pigment called chlorophyll which makes the uh, leave look like green. Likewise, there is, a, an end, there is a pigment called urochrome in the urine, which is supposed to become, make the urine yellowish. When the patient asks us, doctor, how much of water should I take per day so that, you know, I'll be comfortable or I'll be um, healthy? It's a very difficult question, but normally, by and large, we always tell the patient that rather than giving you an exact amount of two or two and a half or three liters per day, you need to look at the urine, color of the urine, that the urine color should be colorless. I mean, I can't say it is like, you know, white because white is completely milky. It should be colorless, it's like water. So for you to make the urine colorless, you need to take at least two, two and a half or three liters. Suppose some patients may take two, they become colorless, they're absolutely fine. But supposing, you know, if it is two, it's still yellowish tinges there, you need to take more water. Why the color becomes? Because the concentration, specific gravity. Because basically the concentrating capacity of the kidney is such that it absorbs more water and then, you know, leaves only a little bit of urine to come out. So especially this happens in summer. Basically, if you don't drink enough water in summer because you're sweating a lot, the water goes out and the what comes out is a concentrated one, yellowish one. So this is purely because of the, the uh, urochrome, the pigment. So the, the, uh, the questioner uh, asked, it's a very good question, like, you know, my liver enzyme, bilirubin is normal, liver function is absolutely normal. It's purely because of the fact, not necessarily it is related to jaundice. You know, jaundice only, you don't have to just get the yellow issue. Normally, my person, if they don't take enough water also. So my question to, my answer to this is one, you, they, you have to take enough water to dilute the urine so that it becomes colorless. Thank you, Dr. Next question is, uh, uh, my scrotum is paining and it and the pain radiates towards the lower pelvis. So what could be the reason? There are many causes for uh, scrotal discomfort or pain. Um, 
you know, one, you need to be examined by the uh, urologist because if it is going to be a scrotal pathology, anything to do with your testicle or testicle has got a tail, what we call as epidermis, or they, there's cord structures which go up in the uh, 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 structure which goes into the lower part of the abdomen. So if there is any liquid collection or the water collection around the test is called hydrocele can cause this kind of discomfort. If you've got varicose seal, that means dilatation of the small blood vessels in the uh, uh, scrotum, if it is enlarged, that can cause discomfort or pain. If you've got hernia, it is coming down to the scrotum, that can cause uh, discomfort or pain. These are all what we call as a local pathology. But there are certain diseases which can cause radiation, that's called referred pain, need not necessarily be pain from coming from the testicle or the scrotum, it may come from the kidney, it may come from the back, from the spine, getting the nerve compression. So pain will start coming, radiating down to the scrotum and can cause this kind of what's called a referred pain as well. So, and there are certain conditions where in which we, after ruling out all those things, we put it down as chronic testicular pain syndrome, where we'll not be able to identify any significant cause for that one that we always just put it down to stress or anxiety related to work, personal work or family issues that can definitely, that's called psychosomatic problem. So you would have seen thousands of uh, doctors, you would have seen, you know, one doctor to other one, because I'm not getting better, I'm not getting better, just go there, go there. The finally, at the end of the day, we always tell, boss, I think you don't have any pathology because everything is normal. So you need to change your uh, behavioral modification. It's called behavioral therapy. So that will definitely help. Thank you. We have another related question uh, where after ejaculation, uh, the, the viewer says his whole body is in pain. Uh, his, he gets fever and his scrotum also pains. Uh, and uh, his urine, while well, he's passing, he has a burning sensation and his uh, erection is also loose. So can you explain about that? Part? Sure. These are all the Putting all together, this is a condition what we call as a chronic prostatitis or chronic pelvic pain syndrome. Here, all these symptoms are related. The ejaculatory dysfunction, that is the pain or discomfort uh, after ejaculation, burning sensation while passing urine, testicular discomfort, penile discomfort, back pain, whole body pain, feverish feeling, all these are related to what we call as a chronic prostatitis. So basically, when you just go to the doctor, the doctor will normally ask for a semen culture to find out whether you've got any infection or not. If the infection is proved by semen culture, then you need to be put on long-term antibiotics. Sometimes what happens is that if you go to the general practitioner, they will put you on antibiotic for five days or seven days, you'll feel better. That comes back again because prostate is a solid gland in which, you know, if you start taking antibiotic for five days, seven days, it's not going to clear. So you need to take antibiotics sometimes for about three months, sometimes for six months time. You have to have a long course of antibiotics to clear the whole infection. That is one thing. And sometimes we tell the patient, boss, you take the medicine for three months time and then you stop it and then you will be fine for six months time. The symptoms will come back again. That means the prostate is coming back again. You self start, but after giving some kind of a culture, semen culture. So, it is an ongoing problem. It's a nagging problem, but unfortunately, you know, it is a nuisance to the patient and to the doctor as well, because unfortunately, we'll not be able to cure the problem. We can only control the problem. Thank you, doctor. Uh, the next question is about ESWL procedure. There's a viewer who would like to ask, uh, is uh, left crossed renal ectopia with uh, pelvic stone and calcial stone with DJ stenting? Mm -hmm. So I think he's done the uh, ESWL procedure in the left kidney. And now he's complaining of pain in the right uh, lumbar region. So I'd like to know your opinion on that. Difficult uh, question. Uh, basically, you know, in anomalous, what we call as anomalous, the position of the kidney. Suppose, you know, it's going to be a, a cross ectopia when which, you know, you've already had the ESWL with the stenting done, which probably I feel the urologist must have thought that's the correct way of going about it. So you have had the procedure, but difficult to explain why you get pain on the right side when you've got the stone on the left side and they've had a ESWL on the left side. So one may be related to muscle pain or you have to have some kind of a scan or a CT to repeat the CT to find out whether you've got a small stone on the right side as well. 
you know, which might not have picked up on the previous imaging studies. So one is going to be positional muscle pain or third could be a generation of a new stone which is developed. So I would definitely advise you to get back to the doctor and get the new imaging done to find out whether you've got any problem there or not. Okay, thank you, doctor. Um, like we're coming towards the end of the session, uh, I'd like to bring up a common topic which is urinary uh, tract infections. Uh, how does uh, one catch such an infection, doctor, and what sort of uh, treatment options are available for that? And like, is, in general, do we need to take any specific precautions, like when we use the toilet, or is is is, is there something which we can control about it? See. Most of the times, you know, attack infection happening in two individuals. That is one in men, another one in women. You know, attack infections are more common in women. The reason being, they've got a short urethra. And then the urethral orifice, the vaginal orifice, plus the anus, all three are close to each other. So the bacteria from the back passage will come and then sit in the vagina from the vaginal orifice then it goes to the urethra that's a common problem that's why we always when patients ask me doc i think you know i, I suffer from recurrent urinary tract infections i always tell them unfortunately i think women are cursed with recurrent infections starting from six months or six years of age to 60 years of age and each period you have a different problem see when they attain puberty or the menarche, hygiene is an issue. And then when they get married, they get infection again. It's called honeymoon cystitis and things like that. So that is related to relationship. And then as you grow old, like 55 or 60, what happens? Hormonal imbalance. So these are the common causes of the recurrent urinary tract infections in women. Women just normally get the infection. And at least 50 to 70% of all women will get one episode of urinary tract infection in the lifetime or if not more. Men urinary tract infection is less compared to women and one episode of infection, even one episode of infection, they need to be investigated very thoroughly because they've got a long urethra. The infection, how does the infection get into the body? It's from outside. It is not from inside. People may say, doctor, I've just taken something, some food, is it because of that particular food that they got from urinary infection? It's got nothing to do with that because the food tract is completely different from your urinary tract. So if at all the bacteria enters the system, it enters only from outside. It's called ascending infection from outside. And then inside bacteria can go into the kidney cause infection only if you are going to be a diabetic. If you have got significantly immunocompromised system, in which case, Definitely, you can get the infection from inside the body, but outside the body is mostly coming from outside through using public toilet. And then, if they people ask, Doctor, I've used the public toilet, have the yes, but the amount of infection what you get from outside is going to be less. So, most of the times, you know, probably what we say is from through relationship. You know, when you have relationship, and supposing the other partner also has got some infection, there's a possibility that you'll transmit the infection from outside. And uh, prevention in uh, um, women, what we normally tell is that drink plenty of water to, you know, just uh, uh, avoid uh, um, the infection. And then, as soon as have your relationship, go to the toilet and pass urine so that in the bladder becomes empty. It's called forceful voiding. Once you empty the bladder, bacteria will get washed out as well. There are certain medications available, what we call the cranberry juice and other things, you know, which is supposed to act on the, because the bacteria goes and sits in the cell. So the, the cranberry juice will go and sit on those particular cells and then it will block the passages so that the bacteria will not have space to go and sit. In. So whereas in men, we always tell, drink plenty of water, just pass urine uh, if, uh, after a relationship, that's all. But men, as I said before, having an infection, if they have it, it could be related to stone disease. It could be related to prostate problem. It could be related to the blockage in the passage. That's totally a different type of infection. So unless you correct the problem, the infection will not go away. Thank you, doctor. On an ending note, can you just share something about sexual health, doctor, like as a good do's and don'ts uh, for the general public so that they'll be uh, educated about it? See, most of the patients who come to us and then uh, they worry too much about the uh, um, 
the uh, um, sexually transmitted diseases, STDs, that is especially HIV. You know, when they say, doc, I think, you know, I had some kind of relationship uh, here and then, um, you know, I'm just slightly worried. See, what happens, you know, when you have this kind of a relationship and supposing if it's going to be any other disease, because there are nearly 10 or 15 types of uh, sexually transmitted diseases, you know, when which you've got syphilis, you've got LGB, lymphogranuloma venerium, you've got uh, herpes genitalis. See, that will just pick up, that will just show exactly like a small ulcer on the penis, which will just, you know, show up so that you go to the doctor and get it treated. But HIV is not like this. You know, if you get HIV, what happens that so it, it might or it might not show any of the things outwardly. People start having some kind of a feverish feeling like flu-like symptom. They think that, you know, everything is, oh, it's a flu-like symptom. It lasts for about a couple of weeks time and then they'll be absolutely fine in about, you know, four to six weeks time. If they, even if they go to the doctor, I think, you know, they do some tests. It may not be picked up on that particular thing. You know, it may take a little bit more time for the test results to just pick up. So by and large, what uh, 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 we as the medical fraternity we always advise is like safe sex. Basically, try to avoid having pros promiscuous relationship. And number two is that if you're just going, please always use condoms. You know, that is one thing, you know, we always just say, you know, unless you have protected sex, you know, if you're going to have unprotected sexual intercourse, it's going to be very difficult. You know, you will have some issues which cannot be picked up early and then you need to, you will suffer at a later date. Thank you so much, Doctor. I think that will be very useful for a lot of people. And uh, on an ending note, what sort of message would you like to give to the public, Doctor? With regards to the uh, men's health, you know, in the beginning itself, uh, um, you just said that men tend to ignore their health purely by the fact they always have, I always, you know, wherever I go, I'll just always say this. Men have this kind of a macho figure. Look, I'm fine. I don't have to go to the doctor. I'm absolutely fine. Why would I just go to the doctor? You know, I'm perfectly healthy. I don't want to waste money on uh, getting the test done and then healthcare done. And then they always take care of their parents. They always take care of the wife. They always take care of the children. That's absolutely fine. You're the breadwinner of the family. What I would suggest is that try to just go for a master checkup. The reason why I'm saying that is that off late, we start seeing too many cancers in young age, starting from the 30, 35, 40, you won't believe. You know, they will just come for a master level. Suddenly you think ultrasounds will pick up those kind of things. So one is going to be what we call as the malignancies we just pick up. So one is going to be master checkup. And number two is that is going to be like people develop non-communicable diseases very common in india is going to be diabetes hypertension fat all these are related to few things right diet right exercise and then you have to have a mind a good mind as well so you have to go for yoga or meditation so if you have the mix of a good thought good food and then exercise physical activity because people say i don't have time you have to make time. That's what I think if you just see some of the WhatsApp messages, you know, people earn money, 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 money. What for? They'll use that money to spend for health. Rather, you use it to prevent it. So prevention is better than cure. Go for a master checkup and then just take care of your health. Thank you so much, Doctor. Thanks a lot for the Thank you. informative session. So with that, we come to the end of this uh, Facebook Live session. Uh, just note about uh, the Apollo Heart Center. Uh, the Apollo Heart Center has a range of uh, clinics, what we call as one-stop clinics, which cover a wide range of uh, clinical specialities. This includes specialist uh, male health clinics, which is being handled by Dr. Thirmali Ganesan. If you'd like to consult a doctor, uh, you can book an appointment by contacting the number 2829-6060. I repeat, 2829-6060. Uh, the alternate number is 733-87-77888. I repeat, 7-3-3-8-7-7-7-8-8. So with that, we come to the end of the session. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you.